Good morning, Dough Rollers. At least it's uh, it's morning as I record this podcast, and I'm really excited about today's show. This is my favorite type of show. Uh, the, the title of it is The Three Ingredients to Lasting Wealth, and it's one of those shows where we're going to break out the spreadsheet, look at some uh, some real numbers, and, 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 and conduct what I call mental experiments. I've got a, a handful of, of, of questions I'm going to ask you throughout this show, uh, and we'll see, you know, hopefully the goal of, the, of this episode is to maybe help us see wealth and money and investing from a new perspective, from a slightly different perspective, ultimately with the goal of motiv- motivating us to do smart things with our money. That's sort of the goal. Uh, we'll see if, if we accomplish it, but it's the three ingredients to lasting wealth. And uh, yeah, so we're going to have the Excel spreadsheet fired up and uh, looking at some real numbers. Before we get to that, just three, I guess, housekeeping matters. The first is, if you haven't joined the Facebook group, please do, doughroller.net slash Facebook. It's been a, a um, you know kind of an experiment for me that I started a few weeks ago, and I've been thrilled with uh, the success of it, the, the, the engagement from folks, a lot of great uh, questions, you know, a lot of topics, and, and and when folks ask, ask a question, there's often four or five, six responses before I even get to it, before I even see it. And that's kind of exactly you know, what I wanted the Facebook uh, group to do. And there's some funny stuff in there. One listener sent me a screenshot of, of the podcast from his, I guess, iPhone or Android, I guess it was an iPhone. And it had the, the, the podcast, uh, the, the names of each show, but it was cut off because it was on a, on a phone. So it was you're not on a computer screen. And so, so DR188, which was the perfect asset allocation was cut off. And all it said was the perfect asset allocation. If you kind of get my drift there in this non-explicit podcast, (laughs) anyway, that was kind of funny. And I, where else can you go to see a picture of my, my beer can collection, which I just put up this morning. Um, So you got that going for you too, if you join the Facebook group. So that's the first thing. Second thing, uh, if you haven't signed up for the newsletter, doorroller.net slash newsletter, I promise you I do not bombard your email inbox with thousands of new, uh, of email. You get one a week every Saturday at 7 p.m., and it includes links to the, the, the content I've published that week on Dough Roller, if I've published an article on Forbes. Um, I, I usually have a book of the week that I'm reading. Last week it was The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, I think was the name of it. Uh, yeah, I read that book, and I'm I'm not a, not ashamed to admit it. Uh, I actually liked it too. Tedious at first, but at the end, um, actually, I'll admit this: it was kind of a powerful book. Anyway, uh, have a tool uh, of the week that I usually include in there. This last one was uh, one from actually the Consumer Financial Protection uh, Bureau that had a have created a tool to help you determine when you should take Social Security, particularly in light of the new changes that have taken effect here recently, or that will take effect. I linked to that this past week. And then I'll just link to other content from across the internet that I think, you know, will help you make the most of your money or that I find interesting or whatever. So that's the newsletter. And again, doorroller.net slash newsletter. And then you can always support this show, doorroller.net slash support, whether it's monthly or one time. And as I've mentioned before, there are plenty of non-financial ways to support the show, including leaving a review on iTunes, sharing it with friends and family, and just participating, shooting me an email, drdorler.net, with a topic you'd like me to cover. Uh, in fact, the topic next week is going to be on donor-advised funds. Uh, and that was a topic suggested by uh, a listener. So I, I'm finally getting to it, and or will next week. I, I have, my wife and I have a donor-advised fund through Vanguard, of course. What would you expect? And I'm uh, going to talk about that and what they are, how you might use them, why you might use them, how they're beneficial. Some drawbacks from them. Uh, or with them. So uh, anyway, you can support the show by shooting me an email. Let me know what you'd like to hear about, or just joining the Facebook group and joining the conversation. Okay, on to the topic, three ingredients to lasting wealth. Now, the thing I want to start with is this. These ingredients apply. I don't care if you're Warren Buffett. These three ingredients apply, whether you're Warren Buffett, LeBron James, Bill Gates, a school teacher, a plumber, a bus driver, a lawyer, a doctor, an accountant. I don't care. These, it, it's the same. This is the, the, I call it the three ingredients to lasting wealth, but basically this is the math, the simple math behind building wealth. And it, I don't, it, it applies universally, no matter who you are. It also doesn't matter how you came to your money. You could have won the lottery. This applies to you. 
uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you, 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 it doesn't matter how much you make. None of that matters. These are the three ingredients. And here they are. The amount you save, the return you get, and the time, how long you invest for. That's it. Amount, return, and time. All of that will determine how much wealth you end up with, what your nest egg is when you retire. Uh, amount, return, and time. Now that, I don't think, is all that exceptional. What gets interesting, though, is when we look at how each of these ingredients factor in to the wealth that you'll eventually obtain. That's where things get interesting. So I want to start with sort of a baseline, if you will. I want to, I want to kind of create for us a, a, a fictional family. I'll call them the six-figure family. They make $100,000. Good for them. By the way, as we go through this, I'm going to use some, some examples, some numbers, some return percentages. Don't get hung up in the numbers I'm choosing. I'm, not going, to, I'm going to ignore inflation, but that's okay. It doesn't matter for, for what we're doing. Um, uh, so, but don't get hung up in the numbers because we're going to change them. But we're going to start with a six-figure family. We're going to assume they save 20% of their income. Very good. So they're saving 20 grand a year. We're going to assume they earn 10%, which would be basically a 100% stock portfolio. You stick your money in the S&P 500 index fund. And if history repeats or even comes close over the next 40 years, and that's going to be our assumption, you're, you're investing for 40 years from, say, I don't know, age 25 to 65, right? You're going to earn 10, 10%. Now, again, we're going to ignore inflation. Uh, and, and, and that means a couple of things. So the, the number that we would end up with 40 years from now, of course, won't buy what it would buy today. We could lower the return percentage from 10% to account for inflation. Of course, we would also then have to increase the contributions, right? Saving $20,000 a year today is not the same as saving $20,000 a year 30 or 40 years from now. So we'd have to, you know, I'm not going to bother with all that because it doesn't matter, not for our purposes. So what would you have? Any ideas? Save 20000 a year earn 10% over 40 years. What would the number be? Well, um, I did the math. And uh, on in Excel, we've talked about this, very easy to do. You would type in the equal sign, and if you go to a cell in, in Excel, it could be Google Sheets or Microsoft Excel, type an equal sign, FV for future value, open paren, and then the percent, 10%, literally one zero in the percentage sign, comma, the number of periods, in this case, 40, where you, you could do periods in terms of months. We're going to do it in years, so just be 40 for 40 years, comma. And the amount you're going to save each period, in this case, is 20,000. Make it a negative 20,000. That produces a positive number. Um, and then close the parentheses. And if you do all of that, the number, I'm going to round here, $8.8 .8 million. $8.8 .8 million is what you end up with. If you invest 20,000 20, a year at 10% uh, for 40 years, $8.8 .8 .8 million, which I'm going to guess even 40 years from now is a lot of money. <laughs> but in any event, there's before we get to the experiments, I'm going to run through five. Let's see, do I have five? Yeah, I got five experiments for you, sort of mental experiments that we're going to work through today. Before we get to those, two observations about this $8.8 .8 million figure that, that, that I think really shed some interesting light on it. The first is what, and the, by the way, the two sort of things I want to share are re related. But the first is what I call the iceberg effect. Of that 8.8 .8 million, only 800,000 of it is from your hard work, making $100,000 a year, managing your money, having a budget, and saving 20,000 a year. If you add up the 20,000 over 40 years, that's 800 grand. Yet you end up with 8.8 .8 million. The point is, the amount you save is just the tip of the iceberg. The vast amount of the, the wealth that you will create, any, anyone will create, anyone who's a long-term investor, does not come from the actual money that you work, you know, sweat and tears, do your work your job, run your business, however you make money, manage your money, uh, save, and put it aside. The vast majority of your, your wealth will not be that actual money that you saved. It will be the returns and the returns on the returns, the compounding that comes from the money that you save. Now, obviously, the money that you save is critical. It's what starts this whole thing moving, right? You, you, don't, you don't earn the $8 million in returns unless you save the 800000 over 40 years to begin with. So it's, it's obviously critical, right? Uh, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. The vast majority of your wealth, when you, you know, after however long you've saved, in this case, our, our, our hypothetical is 40 years, after a lifetime of working, will be returns on the money that you saved and returns on the returns, the compounding, not the actual money 
that you put in your 401k or your IRA uh, or in your taxable account. That's the first sort of observation, the iceberg effect. That's what I call it. The second one, and it's related, is the snowball effect. So we've got the iceberg, we've got the snowball. It's, it's a winter time, so why not? Uh, let's break this down into four decades, 40 years, 10-year periods. In the first decade, you're saving 20000 a year, so that's 200000 over 10 years. What do you end up with after your first 10 years? You've saved 200000 Of course, you're earning 10% return. What do you have after 10 years? Well, the answer is 318000 That might seem to be a surprise to some of you. It doesn't seem like that much. I mean, it's a lot of money, but 10 years, 10% is a, a good, healthy return. You've, you've put away 200 grand, 318, eh, just okay. But decade two, that 318 grows to 1.1 million. And, and the increase in that second decade, you just isolate the second decade, is 826,000. So of the 1.1 million you have after year 20, 318 came the, uh, during the first decade. 826,000 came during the second decade. And then if we do the same thing for the third decade, at the end of 30 years, you have 3.2 million. 2.1 million of it, two-thirds of it, came in that third decade. So decade one, you, 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 you accumulated 318. Just if you isolate decade two, 800, 826,000. Decade three, 2.1 million. And when we go to decade four, as you might imagine, the number gets huge. Just in decade four, 5.5 million. Of the 8.8 .8 million we end with, 5.5 million of it was earned, including your contributions or your savings, but obviously most of it returned, 5.5 million of it was accumulated in that fourth decade. That fourth decade is critical, right? Um, the point is, though, compounding, it's a snowball effect, and it starts out slow. And in fact, it doesn't matter. We could change the amount you say. We could make it 10000 instead of twenty. We could change the return from 10% to 8% or whatever. That first decade is a bit of a slog. It, you, know, you, 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 know, it doesn't, you don't see a huge amount of compounding in that first decade. It really starts to take hold in that second decade. Now, I hope that doesn't discourage folks. You know, if you're just starting out, you're in year one. You're like, oh, my goodness. I got I to gotta get through decade one to really enjoy the re rewards of compounding. Well, yeah, you do. But you know it's coming. And that that's motivation to me. The other thing to keep in mind is at the end of this decade, 318,000, if we're earning 10%, at, at the end of a decade, we're already earning more than we're putting away, right? So uh, if decade 10, we have 318,000, again, if we assume a 10% return, we're going to make just under $32,000 in returns in, in year 11. That That's significantly more than the 20,000 that we're saving. Again, we could use 8% and it would it would generally be the same result. The point is after not too long, let's call it 7 to 10 years, depends on exactly, you know, what your return is. Your returns will start to eclipse how much you're saving. And certainly when you get into decade 2, it will far exceed what you're saving. And in decade 3 and 4, you know, what you're saving almost seems like chump change compared to what you're earning. The thing I like about both the iceberg effect, as I call it, and the snowball effect, uh, we, we use the snowball term in, in getting out of debt, so I don't want to confuse it, but the iceberg effect and the snowball effect is it really shows us the power of compounding. It is huge, and if we're going to build wealth, we have to harness that power. We have to. What we save is going to be, you know, peanuts compared to what we, what we end up with if we harness the power uh, of compounding. So with that, um, I want to go to the five experiments. So experiment one is this. We've talked about the three ingredients, amount versus time versus return. Which one's the most important? Now, that's kind of a trick question, but let's, let's, let's um, set up an experiment. Let's do this. One by one, we'll reduce each one in our hypothetical. Remember, our hypothetical is save 20000 a year at 10% return for 40 years. One by one, let's reduce each by 10%. Calculate what we'll end up with and... You know, we'll start with the amount. We'll reduce it from 20000 a year to eighteen. Calculate what we'd have after 40 years at 10%. Then reset the numbers. Reduce the return by 10%. So 10% uh, would become 9%. Run the numbers. See what we'd have. Then set the numbers back. Then reduce the time, the 40 years, by 10%. So that would take it to 36 years. Run the numbers. How do you think the numbers would come out? Would, would it, does it matter? Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe the, the, the end result is the same. 
because we're reducing each by 10%, or if it's different, maybe it's just different by a little bit, right? Um, what do you think? Well, um, I did the math, so let's take a look at it. So if we reduce the amount we save, and by the way, the thing I like about this is, you know, we talk about returns, obviously, and time, but in our day-to-day -day lives, I think most people are focused on the amount they save, and it's important. I, I, by all means, it's important. But we tend to focus on that. That's, that's when we're budgeting and trying to, you know, spend less than we make and put the money away. It's a really important topic. But sometimes I think it overshadows the returns uh, and the time. And it shouldn't, as we'll see. So if we reduce the $20,000 contribution by 10%, that means we contribute $18,000 uh, at 10% for 40 years. What do we end up with? It turns out it doesn't drop the number by that much. Um, given the iceberg effect, that eh, probably isn't all that surprising. Uh, but it still drops the number. We go from 8.8 .8 million uh, uh, to just 8 million. So it drops at 800,000, about 10% roughly. Makes sense, right? We reduced our, our contribution by 10%. So 8.8 .8 million down to, to 8 million if we, if we contribute 20,000 a year instead of, uh, excuse me, if we contribute 18,000 a year instead of 20. All right. What if we reduce um, the return? So we, we contribute 20000 we do it for 40 years, but we only earn 9% instead of 10. It's just 1%, right? How much can that affect it? Well, this hurts a little bit. We go from $8.8 million all the way down to $6.6 .6 million. Big, big difference. I'd much rather contribute 18000 a year and earn that 10% than contribute 20% uh, 20000 a year and earn 9%. You lose a lot just from that 1%. You're talking $2.2 million bucks. All right, let's set the return back to 10% and drop our years, our time, by 10%. So we'll save 20000 a year, we'll earn 10%, but we'll invest for 36 years instead of 40, four years. How much could that affect it? Well, it has the biggest impact of all. You shave just four years, so you start saving at 29 instead of 25. Doesn't seem like that big a deal. Your $8.8 .8 million drops to $6 million. Huge difference, $2.8 million. Huge, huge difference. The takeaway is this. Yes, how much we save is important. It's very important. It's what, it's what gets us going down this uh, path of, 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 of building wealth and eventually allowing the returns and the time to take the small amounts that we save and turn them into something really amazing. It, it's like it's the seed, right? You can't have the tree without the seed. You can't have the plant without the seed. That 20000 is really important. But it's the return and the time that really turn it into something amazing. And we, so we should never, so when we're talking about fees, we're going to get to this. I'm going to look at some specific examples. When we talk about fees, you know, we shouldn't be dismissive of it. They matter. When we talk about our asset allocation, we shouldn't dismiss an 80-20 portfolio versus a 60-40 portfolio as unimportant. It's critical. It's not critical if for one year or over two years. It's not even all that important, really, over five or 10, but boy, 20, 30, 40 years, it's huge. Time and return have a much, much bigger impact um, than uh, the amount you save. Again, amount you save is important. It's what gets this whole thing rolling, but don't underestimate the importance and power of your return, your after-fee return, and time. Now, we're going to look into some specifics here that I think will really drive this point home. All right, let's move on to experiment number two. This is in some ways my favorite. So here's what we're going to do. I want to show, the, show you the power of the return that you get and how, I think we've already seen, but another way to look at how even a small difference in, in the return, uh, maybe because you pay high fees or you know, maybe you have an asset allocation that isn't just right or whatever, but how it can make a huge difference. Here's what we're going to do. We've already talked about our six-figure family. You know, They make 100 grand a year. Save 20%, that is 20,000 uh, a year for 40 years at 10%. Now let's compare them to what I'll call the five figure family. This is a family that makes 50,000 a year, saves 20%, just like our six figure family. Of course, that ends up being less, 10,000 a year, uh, same return, 10%, same time period, 40 years. So let's first just compare those two. Of course, we know since there's the five figure family saving half, but earning the same return, same number of years, they're going to end up with half of what the six-figure family uh, earns. So we know the six-figure family, 8.8 .8 million after 40 years. So our five-figure family, 
4.4 million. Now, then the question though for this sort of uh, mental experiment is this, how much uh, less in return, how much would the return uh, have to go down before the six-figure family ended up with the same amount after 40 years as the five-figure family? So even though they're saving twice as much for 40 years, how much of that the return would have to dip below 10% for them to end up with the same roughly 4.4 million that our five-figure family has. Now, you know, we could take an extreme example. We'd say, well, let's think about this here. You know, our five-figure family at 10% uh, in, the, in the stock market, S&P 500 index fund, you know, what if the six-figure family just kept their money in a savings account and they were earning today 1%? Well, it's not even a comparison at that point. You know what, what, what you get? At 1% over 40 years, you end up with 977000 I mean, it's just a joke. That tells you, it gives you a, a different kind of insight into a savings account return, right? 977000 so That's obviously a non-starter. But we might think, well, why don't we cut the return in half, right? I mean, if, 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 if the six-figure family is saving twice as much, we want to figure out what the return would be uh, that would cause them to end up uh, uh, having the same amount of money as our five-figure family saving half as much, let's cut the return in half, 5%. Now, you know, if you've been following along, you're thinking, yeah, Rob, nah, that ain't going to work because, you know, that whole compounding, you've already told us return and time uh, have a, a you know outsized impact on all this. So 5%, nah, I'm not buying it. Well, you'd be right. If you earned 5% over those 40 years, you'd end up with $2.4 million, still well below the $4.4 million figure that our five-figure family earns. So the 5% doesn't do it. So, okay, let's jack it up to 7%. That's you know, a pretty good return. We're, we're down 3% off the 10. Would that do it, 7%? No, not quite. You get close. At 7%, our six-figure family would have $4 million at the end of 40 years. Not quite the $4.4 million we need. Turns out that all you need to do to bring that six-figure family down to the five-figure family in terms of nest egg at the end of 40 years is drop their return by about 2.5%. If they were to earn 7.5%, uh, they would end up with just a little bit more than the five-figure family, about $4.5 million instead of $4.4 million. The point is, and to me, that's not a lot. That's not a huge difference, or at least on the surface, it doesn't appear to be a big difference. But if you, if you just drop that 10% return down to 7.5%, you end up with the same amount of money, even though you save twice as much for 40 years, 40 years of savings, twice as much as the five-figure family. But if you earn just 2.5% less, that is 7.5% instead of 10%, you end up with the same amount of money. Now, we might say, well, 2.5% is kind of a lot, really, now you know, that we think about it. I mean, what would cause that? Well, I bought an investment advisor fee of 1% or 1.5% coupled with high expense ratios, uh, maybe with the wrong asset allocation, and add to that bailing out of investments at the wrong time because you get scared of the stock market. Goodness, you add all those together, could easily exceed 2.5%. Wouldn't be hard at all uh, to take a 10% return and drop it to 7.5% or lower uh, for any one or more of those uh, combinations of issues. And we're going to come back to them. The thing I wanted to show you with this second experiment, though, is it doesn't take a lot uh, of a reduction in your return to have, in this case, our hypothetical, a six-figure family saving twice as much to end up with the same amount of money as if they had saved half as much or as much as what I call our five-figure five family. Really, again, just another way to look, frankly, at the same thing, which is what we're doing today. We're really looking at compounding just from different angles to hopefully shed some new light on this for you and hopefully influence the way we think about investing and uh, managing money and wealth. And uh, so that's the goal. So that's experiment number two, uh, return. How about experiment number three, time? What if these two families, they six-figure family saves 20%, five-figure family saves 10% a year. They both earn 10%, so we're done messing with the return number. But what if the six-figure family got started a little later? They didn't, they didn't actually save for 40 years. How many years you know, could they lose before they end up with the same amount of money as our five-figure family? Well, again, you can imagine, well, why don't we just, you know, you could say, well, let's just cut it in half. 
let's just assume they save for 20 years, uh, you know, rather than 40, since we, you know, they're, they're saving twice as much. Now, of course, I, I know you guys know that ain't, that ain't going to be the answer, right? But let me just plug it in. I don't actually have that number. So I'm plugging it in now to my spreadsheet, 20 years, 10% return, saving 20,000, 20,000 a year. You end up with 1.1 million. I mean, it's not even close to the 4.4 million our five-figure family uh, earn. So I did the math. Turns out, if you if you get a seven year start uh, late start if you if you don't save for forty years you save for thirty three, but you save twice as much during those thirty three years, uh, you end up with the same amount of money roughly roughly the four point four million as our five figure family. So that's all it takes a delay of seven years, uh, and that cuts in half. You know if you if you compare the twenty thousand a year versus ten thousand a year, you just delay seven years. Think about that. That that's only I say only it's still a lot of money. Take about think about the amount uh, you're not putting away. Seven years times twenty thousand a year, it's one hundred and forty thousand dollars. Obviously, a lot of money, but it drops you from an eight point eight million dollar nest egg. That hundred twenty hundred and forty thousand drops you from eight point eight million to four point four million. I mean, it's just an it's an outsized impact. That's the thing. These seemingly relatively small changes, and I don't mean to suggest one hundred and forty thousand is small, but compared to you know four point four million, it is. And it has that kind of impact, just a delay in seven, seven years. That's it. You start saving at 32 uh, instead of 25. Now, if you're 40 and you're saying, Rob, I'm just getting started now. Please don't get depressed on me. Um, uh, you know, they're, 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 this is designed to show you the various impacts. If you're getting this late start, my only advice to you is start now, right? It's going to be better than starting tomorrow, next month, next year, next decade. But... I, you know, we can't change the math. Time does matter. In fact, a large part of Warren Buffett's wealth, you know what it comes from? The fact that he's lived so long. If he had died 10 years ago, he wouldn't have, he probably wouldn't have half the wealth he has today. I mean, the, 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 the amount he's accumulating now in his wealth over the last decade is huge. It's, it's the same math. The last decade for Warren Buffett has been much, much bigger in terms of wealth accumulation than the previous decade. And that was much, much bigger than the decade before that. It applies to everybody. All right. Now, what I want to do with experiments four and five is start to combine these. We've talked about return. Uh, we've talked about time. Um, what happens if we start to combine these? What kind of uh, changes do you need before that six-figure family ends up with as much as the five-figure family? So let's start with time and return. If we want to combine these two. And what I did, I said, okay, well, let's, let's um, you know, we know that if you reduce the return by two and a half percent, uh, the six-figure family ends up with the same amount of money as the five-figure family. Let's not do that. Let's just reduce it by 1%. And I pick that because that's a typical investment advisor fee, 1%. And there's certainly, we've talked about them. There are many that are lower. Vanguard is 30 basis points. There are many that are higher, including very well-known people that are very popular that I won't name at the moment, but they I've seen them as high as 2%. Uh, but we're just going to assume 1%. So the six-figure family uh, they're saving twenty thousand a year at 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 ten um, uh, percent, but they're paying a one percent investment advisory fee. So their their after fee return is nine percent. Now we know that won't bring them down to the four fi the five figure family. That would require two and a half percent. We're only going to reduce it by one percent. But what if they also delayed? They didn't start at age twenty five, or they didn't save uh, for forty years. You know, we know a seven year delay. Um, brings them to, 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 to equal at 10%. But now we've got this 1% investment advisory fee. So that seven years is going to gonna get a little smaller, right? a little shorter. And it turns out it does. If you add a 1% investment advisory fee, bringing their after fee return to 9%, at that point, in order to equal the five-figure family, all it requires is a five-year delay. So if you combine the two, a five-year delay with a 1% investment advisory fee, uh, then that... $20,000 a year savings ends up uh, bringing them the same amount uh, of money that the five-figure family has, saving half as much. Now, we could play with those numbers. If the percent if we were to increase the 1% to 1.5, uh, the five-year delay would get shorter. It would only require about a four-year delay or whatever the numbers would be. The point is, as we combine time and return, what you see is the, the, the difference is, you know, a five-year delay, it's not that big a deal. At least uh, it doesn't seem like it. And a lot of people, you know, don't have that urgency about saving. If you're in your 20s and you think you've got all the time in the world, you don't. Because you need to get past that first 10 years, right? We talked about that at the beginning. 
uh, the snowball effect. You need to get that first 10 years locked away. And then, uh, if, frankly, that's more important than the savings uh, for the rest of your life. Get that first 10 years knocked out. So if you're 20, don't think you've got plenty of time. You don't. A five-year delay is going to make a huge impact down the road. Combine that with a 1% investment advisory fee and our Fancy Pants six-figure family. And I have no idea why I just called them Fancy Pants, but I did, and I'm not going to delete it. <laughs> uh, they end up with the same nest egg as our five-figure family. It doesn't take that much uh, to effectively negate saving twice as much a year. Now, that was experiment number four, time and return. What if we do an experiment five, time return in terms of, but also throw in an asset allocation twist to this. So let's imagine our six figure family does this. Uh, they want a quote unquote safe portfolio. So they have 60% stocks and 40% bonds. Now I'm not saying that's a bad asset allocation. This is just a hypothetical, but we're going to call it safe. Now, uh, before I go on, we should just touch on that. Why am I calling that safe? And I'm, I'm doing air quotes. Of course you can't see it, but I'm doing air quotes. Uh, when professionals talk about risk, they're referring to volatility. So they say stocks are riskier than bonds because they go up and down more. Uh, yes, they can go up higher than bonds in a given year, but they can crash, go down much more than bonds. So when they talk about risk, think volatility. Now, is that a good way to define risk? Well, not really. Let me give you an example. What if I said to you, I want to get from Washington, D.C. to L.A., in the in, in the least risky way. I don't want risk. Most people would think, all right, so you don't want to die. And most people would think planes are riskier than cars. I don't really want to get into that debate. <laughs> Let's just assume that's the case. So they would say you should drive. Uh, you, you know, I mean, it's not risk-free. You could get into an accident, but, um, you know, you avoid the risk of of, 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 of of a plane crash. And a lot of us, you know, that's kind of a, certainly something that you know, we might fear, certainly, because we don't want to die in a car accident either. But, you know, let's just assume that's the safest way to go. And I said, well, okay, I get that, uh, but I have to be there in eight hours. Uh, oh, sorry. Well, if you drive, you're guaranteed to fail. Your risk is 100%. I didn't realize you wanted to get there in eight hours. You didn't say that, Rob. Well, that's true. I didn't. You have to fly. You have to fly. That's the only way you're going to do it. I kind of look at investing the same way. People say, I want to be safe, you know, and so, okay, well, let's do a a portfolio that's got a lot of bonds in it, 50-50 portfolio, or our, our hypothetical, a 60-40 portfolio. Uh, uh, yes, there'll be some volatility, but not nearly as much as, say, an 80-20, 90-10, or, goodness, 100% stock portfolio. And we all feel good about that and say, oh, but why, wait a minute. I do need this amount of money by the time I retire. Oh, I'm sorry. You need this much by the time you retire? Well, you'll never get there with a 60-40 or 50-50 portfolio. It won't give you enough return. So this quote-unquote safe approach is guaranteed to fail. My point is this. When you're figuring out your asset allocation, it's perfectly fine to consider volatility. Um, and it's important to consider volatility. You don't want to go into an investment plan that you can't stick to um, in a bad market. Because then you're going to bail at the wrong time and it's going to create um, you know, more problems for your, your retirement uh, investments uh, than if you just started with a, with a less volatile asset allocation to begin with. However, you also need to look at the goals you're trying to achieve in terms of the amount of money you need to retire at the age you want to retire. So it's not all about volatility. Hope that makes sense. In any event, experiment number five, we're going to go with a quote unquote safe portfolio of 6040. Now we know from a Vanguard page, and I'm going to leave this on the Facebook group, a link to it, but I've talked about it before. They have sort of based on historical numbers going all the way back, I think to the twenties, what the return would be for each of these portfolios, in this case, a 60-40, including the best year and the worst year, and how much it went down or up. So a long story short, a 60-40, 60 stocks, 40% bonds portfolio um, historically has returned 8.8%, uh, compound annual growth rate of 8.8%. So we'll use that for our six-figure family. We'll tack onto that a 1% investment advisory fee that they're going to pay. And then the question is, now with these assumptions, what kind of delay would bring them to uh, a nest egg at the end of their uh, working years comparable to this five-figure family? Well, get this. If we assume just a three-year delay, that's it. A three-year delay, a 60-40 portfolio, and a 1% advisory fee, get this. They don't match the five-figure family at the end of 40, 40 years. 
they underperform the five-figure family by more than half a million dollars. I hope you let that sink in because the assumptions we're using are not at all out of the ordinary. 60-40 portfolio, not out of the ordinary, even for long-term investors. 1% advisory fee, pretty standard in the industry. A three-year delay, I mean, really? Starting at 28 versus 25, how big a deal can that be? Well, you add those together compared to a five-figure family saving half as much, and at the end of 40 years, you underperform by half a million dollars. Now, again, I want to stress something. I'm not suggesting the 60-40 portfolio is a mistake or bad. Uh, for that matter, I'm not suggesting that a 100% stock portfolio, which is effectively what we're assuming for our five-figure family, is a good thing for you. Some people do that, particularly long, long-term investors, and that's fine as long as you can stick with the plan. The point is that these seemingly um, you know, small differences, 60-40 portfolio, even compared to, say, an 80-20, a 1% advisory fee, a three-year delay, when you multiply all of that over several decades of investing, it has a huge, huge impact on uh, your wealth and, and, and your nest egg uh, when you come to retiring. Now, the other thing I want to stress is that none of this takes into account the harm you do to your portfolio if out of fear you sell when the market's down 10 or 20 or 30%, or for that matter, uh, if you buy more, more equities when the market's up because you feel like you're missing out. I mean, this whole thing can go either way. You can sell in a down market or buy in an extremely expensive market because you think you're missing out on these equities that seem to go up and up every day. None of what we've done, none of the five experiments take into account the negative impact on your portfolio when you do those things. So, it, so in some ways, it, it gets even worse. These small changes, if you abandon your investment plan, um, it, it, abandoning your investment plan is just throwing gasoline on the fire. That's exactly what it's doing. Um, so it's important to have your investment plan and be sure you can stick to it through thick and thin. So I, I hope these experiments have ho helped you see building wealth and compounding in a slightly different light. Uh, I hope it shows just how important these decisions are. If you're going to pay a fee for someone to help you, that's fine. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but what's that fee? And is it really worth it? Yeah, I cringe when someone says I'm paying someone one and a half percent so they can stick my money in four mutual funds or even worse, even worse than that. So they can stick my money in 20 mutual funds, which, by the way, is just ludicrous. If you do that on your own and that's how you like to invest, that's fine. I have good friends that do that. But to pay someone to do that, why are they doing why? Why 20 funds? My hunch is it's because it makes it, it, it it's how they they try to convince people that the fee that you're paying is worth it because I've got you in 20 different funds, when a three-fund or a five-fund portfolio would accomplish the same thing, frankly, probably better. In any event, these small decisions or seemingly small decisions have a big, big impact over decades of investing. Take them seriously. So what are the takeaways? One, you know, the amount we save is important. I got five takeaways, by the way. Number one, the amount we save is obviously important. It's what starts all of this. It's what gets the snowball rolling. But it's just one third of the equation, and I would say it's even less than that. Never, ever underestimate the importance of time, how, how long you invest, and your after fee returns. By the way, you could add to that after fee, after taxes, after inflation return, but we're talking about fees today. Never, never underestimate the importance of those two things. Number two, we've seen how important time is. Start saving today, even if it's 25 bucks a month in a 401k or in Betterment, I cringe when I hear people say, no, no, I'm going to pay off all my non-mortgage debt first before I save anything. Really? Why are you doing that? It doesn't make any sense in most cases. I mean, we could come up with a hypothetical where it did because you're paying 30% in interest. But for most people, that almost never makes sense. It just doesn't. And by the way, if you're foregoing a 401k match, so that you can, you know, pay pay student loans that that, that are that are costing you five percent, and it's going to take you ten years to pay them off. Well, I just think that's crazy. Start today, even if it's a small amount, it'll have a big impact down the road. And once you start saving, it's easier. <laughs> I like that easier to ratchet it up a little bit. You get that raise, and your twenty five bucks a month becomes seventy five bucks. You get another raise, it goes it becomes a hundred. Uh, that's how I did it. My first investment, as I recall, and this was in 1993, was 100 bucks a month. Um, you know, it was a small amount of money relatively. I know that was 
more then than it is now, but it's still a relatively, relatively small amount of money. Start small. That's fine. Just start. All right. Three, understand the importance of the stock bond allocation decision. You know, we talk about asset allocation. There's all kinds of things that we talk about. Do you, should you have REIT exposure, uh, emerging cap, uh, emerging market exposure? Should you, should you tilt your portfolio to value, small cap? These are all fine things to discuss, and we discuss them, and I figure them out for myself. The most important decision is stocks versus bonds. Volatility is important to consider, but so is reaching your retirement goals. So don't don't sacrifice reaching your retirement goals by just focusing on volatility. Um, consider volatility. Consider your ability to stick with an investment plan in good markets and bad. That's really, really important. But don't lose sight of why you're doing this in the first place, your ultimate goals, whatever they are for your life, whether it's early retirement, retiring at 65, uh, providing for a child's education, leaving money to your children or grandchildren, whatever your, your goals are, don't lose sight of those and focus just on the volatility. The stock bond allocation decision is critical. Number four, think long and hard before paying somebody to put your money in mutual funds. Again, I'm not suggesting you shouldn't have an investment advisor, uh, but there are a lot of options, whether it's a, a robo-advisor like Betterment or Wealthfront, someone like Vanguard, uh, that charges 30 basis points. My good friend Rick Ferry, Portfolio Solutions, I think he charges, I want to say 37 per basis points, not positive. Um, he's probably more for high net worth folks, I think really at, at a minimum a half a million, but probably more like a million. But there are a lot of options besides paying someone one and a half percent. So if you're going to use someone, think long and hard about who you're going to use and how much uh, they're charging you. And then, of course, the fifth one, we've talked about this many times. Watch those expense ratios. They really matter. The key really is your weighted average expense ratio. Um, uh, you know, you can have one fund that maybe is a high expense ratio because it invests in whatever, emerging market bonds, if that's your thing. Uh, but but it's really your weighted average expense ratio, which is why I had you all calculate that a few weeks ago in our question of the week. And that brings me to our, our last question of the week, uh, for the month of November, which I asked last week, got a lot of great responses. Haven't actually picked the winner. Uh, I do that randomly, and I'm going to pick the winners as soon as I finish this uh, podcast and uh, and announce that on the uh, the Facebook page. But if you're if you're one of the winners, I will send you an email. But I got a lot of great articles, and I've slowly been um, sharing those links uh, on the in the Facebook group. It's just the easiest way to do it. So join the Facebook group if you haven't. And you'll see those, but I really appreciate uh, you folks sending in, uh, you know, some of your favorite articles. Many of them I'd seen before because I pretty much all I do all day is read on, on online about finance. But there were all plenty that I'd never seen before, and a lot of great stuff. Uh, I, I really think the the questions of the week were a hit in the month of November. I'm going to take a break from it just for a little bit of time, but I'm probably going to come back to them because. Uh, they really seem to spark a lot of interest and uh, really appreciate those that participated. And congrats to those who won the $25 Amazon gift cards again for this week. Well, by the time you listen to this podcast, I will have already sent out the emails. So if you got an email, you know you won. And if you didn't, by the time you're listening to this, uh, you didn't. But thanks for 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 sending in the, the articles. Much, much appreciated. Well, there you go. If you have any questions about this episode or or any of the podcasts or you want a topic, you want me to cover a topic, the best thing to do is leave uh, a note in the Facebook group. But you can also email me, dr at dorler.net. I do read every single email, uh, even if it takes me a little while. So listen, I hope you have a great week. And remember, until next time, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.